There was just this magnetic pull of wanting to connect with God more and more. The more vehemently atheist my husband became, the more spiritual I became. I started emailing Roman Catholic nuns when I was married, and I said, I'm married, and I still can't get this calling out of my mind. I'm, I'm drawn to this, and I don't know what to do. From the Totem Project, this is Full Moon Women, a community and a podcast about the inner lives of women. On today's episode, we dive into the story of Claudette Powell, known in her religious life as Sister Monica Clare. Sister Monica is an Episcopal nun at the community of St. John Baptist in Mindham, New Jersey. Her story of finally embracing her authentic self was highlighted by Oprah. Sister Monica is on TikTok as at Nonsense for the People and has a following of over 143,000. She's 55 years old and didn't become a nun until she was 46. This is her story. I'm Jamie Younger, your host. Before we get going with Sister Monica's story today, I want to say this. The show that you're listening to, it's not just a podcast. This show is a springboard, a taking off point, a soul starter, if you will, for our lives as women. This show is for women who are stretching themselves, questioning themselves, looking deeper, and being brave. If you're doing that, you are a full moon woman. This show is designed as a foundation for a community of women who support one another. In the coming months, we'll be inviting you to live online events and to join a social space so you can connect with other women from around the world who are listening to this show. We have a goal of 1,000 full moon members by the end of this year. More on that later. I'll share details at the end of the show. As you know, on this podcast, we publish episodes in couplets. The first episode in each couplet is a woman's story, something personal from her inner life. And the follow-up episode is a conversation with someone who can give us greater context and hopefully a greater appreciation for the storytelling woman's story. Today, we hear Claudette Powell's story. And in two weeks, you'll hear my conversation with Maria Sirawa, an expert in mind-body medicine and the author of A Short Course in Happiness After Loss. Maria lectures around the world on resilience, authenticity, and what it takes to really flourish. I grew up with a picture of what nuns looked like. I had two aunts who were Roman Catholic nuns. One of them brought me a little colorful purse from Guatemala after she had spent time there working with the poor. I still have that purse, and my daughter plays with it occasionally. As a kid, of course, I never talked to my aunts about their lives. I just knew that they had two names, the ones that they used when they were little girls with my mom, and the ones that they had after they had become nuns. When Pete and I stumbled upon the story of Claudette Powell, I was transfixed. I wanted to talk to her as a woman, as a spiritual person, and as a human. She has a pretty unusual story. Before becoming a nun, she was married and living in Los Angeles, working for Paramount Pictures in their advertising department. She was living a totally secular life. But despite all outward appearances, she had been drawn to the life of a nun from a very early age. I remember when I was a little kid, there was the Sunday afternoon matinee on television, and they would rebroadcast movies from the 50s, 60s, 40s. I don't remember exactly which year it was. I was seven or eight years old. The movie was The Nun's Story, and it was based on a book by Catherine Holm. The movie was made in 1959, and it starred Audrey Hepburn. And, of course, it was very much a Hollywood version of what life is like in a convent in Belgium. I do remember the images from that movie, that Audrey Hepburn's energy in that movie was what really drew me in. It was this sort of calm, serene energy of a nun. And of all things in the movie, the visuals, the story and everything, it was that energy that attracted me, the way that she was so fixated on God. The whole story of the film is about her sort of struggling with her vocation to be a sister. 
And in the book, which I later read, she leaves the sisterhood and goes off and has a different life. And that part didn't really register with me back then. What really registered was this energy of calmness and uh, focus. That really made a huge impression on me. The calmness that appealed to her stood in stark contrast to what was happening in her real life. Our home was very chaotic. I had very young parents. They were Southern. They had known each other since they were 12 years old. They got married when they were 16. So it was almost like they were my older brother and sister instead of my parents. And they had a very tumultuous, passionate relationship where they fought a lot. My father had a horrendous temper, was uh, violent. At that time, he was throwing things and um, screaming and yelling a lot. He couldn't seem to hold a job. So we had a lot of financial instability. We moved almost constantly. We were left to ourselves quite a bit from a very young age. I'm talking like three or four years old. Back then, the world was a safer place and people would leave their kids by themselves. My sister, my older sister, who's 16 months older than I, we were sort of this little team together. And most of our life was trying to be quiet and stay out of my father's way. He worked third shift a lot. When he was able to hold a job, he worked third shift. So we had to learn to be very quiet. So my home life was was chaotic and scary. As a young kid, Claudette dealt with some pretty strange behavior from her dad. She remembers one moment in particular. I remember there was an incident where he... Um, came home one night from his job and he was just beaming from ear to ear and he was so happy. And he was standing out in the yard talking to my mom and my sister and I. I must have been about four or five years old. And he said, oh, my friend so-and-so, you know what he just did? He did the greatest thing. He left his wife and his kids and he's never going back. He's the happiest person I've ever met. That made a huge impression on me as a kid because I felt like the reason he was always mad and in a bad mood was because he had to earn a living to support the kids. And he would talk about, if, if I didn't have all these mouths to feed, I could have a much better life. So that makes a big impression on a kid. When you grow up poor, you feel like a little bit of a burden to your parents. And I, I'll never forget how happy he was for that guy. Claudette's mom was very kind, even if she wasn't always the most stable parental figure. She played Barbies with her daughters. She was a Southern woman through and through, placing value on good looks. But she was also a free spirit and undeniably stunningly beautiful. I mean, she looked like a movie star and she still kind of does. She has platinum blonde hair, green eyes. She was always the most gorgeous woman in any room. She was also a free spirit. At that time, she was kind of like a sort of a hippie, like the Southern version of a hippie. She was into astrology and yoga. She and my father had lived in France when my dad was in the army. He entered the army when he was 18 years old. And they lived in France, I think, for three or four years right outside Paris and my older sister was born there and, and really sort of staying in the American hospital. So my mom had come back to the States with this sort of Brigitte Bardot persona. She was not, on the other hand, a very structured mom. She was not strict in the sense that most people think of their parents. She was more like our sister. She was funny, extremely funny, super intelligent. And sort of at the mercy of this husband of hers, who was also extraordinarily good looking. So the two of them were like this, this gorgeous couple. And people around them had no idea that my father was so violent and so unpredictable at home because he was very charming out in the world. And my mother absolutely adored him. She was obsessed with him. The lack of structure, the feeling of chaos, the economic uncertainty made me very, very serious and responsible and organized in reaction to that chaos. And 
I found a lot of other Gen X people who had that same experience. Their parents were breaking down all the structures and being free spirits, which made kids at that time feel lost and uh, afraid. Because to us, it didn't feel like freedom. It felt like chaos and danger. Being a latchkey kid from Gen X, spending a lot of time without parental supervision, we grew up to need structure. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me to the religious life was the structure, the tradition, the sense of family that I really didn't have when I was growing up. My mother was a lot of fun, but we didn't sit down to dinner every night. We didn't have a bedtime. In many ways, that made us unique individuals to not have the strictness around us, but um, it also made me yearn for structure. She told me that when she was a kid, she often felt the presence of God around her. I've always thought that trying to describe God or energy or emotions was a little like trying to describe art. But nevertheless, I asked her to share what God's presence had felt like for her as a kid. Some of my most vivid memories when I was a child are of feeling God's presence around me. My grandmother was extremely religious, which didn't sit well with my parents' generation. You know, they thought that religious people were uptight and repressive, and they used religion as a weapon. But my grandmother wasn't like that. She was very gentle and kind. And to me, she was the perfect personification of being a good Christian. So she took me to church, and she did her daily Bible devotionals every day and was really quiet about her faith. But to me, I was drawn to her because she was such a good person. And she had that same calm, focused energy that I saw in that movie, The Nun's Story. She was just really um, centered as a person. So I was attracted to that energy with her. And I would go to church and I would hear sermons. You know, we went to a Southern Baptist church, but it wasn't one of those what they call hard shell Baptists. It wasn't like that. We had a lovely preacher there. And sometimes they would have guest preachers come in that were sort of a little bit more hellfire and brimstone. And we'd all be traumatized by those sermons. But <laughs> but uh, one of them, I remember when I was maybe three or four years old, one of them said, anything you want to give to God, you just say, I'm going to give this to you, I'm giving it to you, and he'll take it from you. You know, and what he was really talking about was your gifts, your talents. But I was too little to understand that. My grandfather was kind of an eccentric, and he had this garbage dump behind the house where they burned the garbage, because <laughs> that's what you did in the old days. You burned your garbage. And there was this old pot out there, like a saucepan in the garbage heap. And after we got home from church, I ran out there, and I got that pot. And I remember it had a hole in the bottom of it. That's why it had been thrown away. And I stood out in the driveway holding it up to God and saying, I want to give you this, God. <laughs> I don't know how long I stood out there. It seemed like forever. And I was thinking it would be like in the cartoons, you know, where God's hand would come down and take that pot from me. <laughs> and God didn't. And I was so confused. So I talked to my grandmother about it. And she said, well, that's not exactly what the preacher was talking about. But that's very generous of you to offer something to God. That's her kind of spirituality. It was very sweet and very gentle. And I remember asking God, I was standing out once again in the driveway. I had an umbrella on a windy day, and I was begging God, please let this umbrella pick me up and help me fly around. <laughs> and God didn't do that either. So I learned very early on, God doesn't answer all our prayers because some of them are crazy. <laughs> so Claudette was growing up like that, under her grandmother's wing, having a notion that God was important to her life. At age 13, some big disruptive things happened in her life. Two things happened when I was 13. One of them was my parents divorced. And at that time, things had gotten so violent. He was, he was beating my mother up uh, on a regular basis at that point. And he had always beat on us, the kids, which 
was actually not that uncommon in the South at the time. Everybody beat their kids, so it wasn't unusual. But when he started beating up my mother, that brought everything to a head. He was a policeman at the time, which is crazy. But at that time, there were no laws against beating your spouse. This was like 1978, 79. He was fired from the police department. He was placed in a a mental hospital because he had gotten so far off the the rails on, on drugs and alcohol. My mother was also put into a mental institution because she had a breakdown. I was with her when she had it. It was very scary, very traumatic. And so at the age of 13, I became much more of an adult. I had been a little adult before then, but um, I became sort of the the responsible adult in my family. My older sister was away. She had gotten a scholarship to a boarding school for dance. So I was left to take care of the baby and clean the house and, and buy the groceries and things like that. My grandmother had died when a, between age 12 and 13 was when she died. So that was a big time for me. Everything was transitioning. I didn't have my grandmother anymore. She was like a mother to me, basically. I lived with my aunt for a little while while my mother was in the mental institution. I remember at the time feeling like, all right, I'm grown up. I'm on my own. Me and my little sister, who's eight years younger than me, we were just a little family. And then... When my mother got out of the mental institution, she was put into a program for single mothers where they provided her an education. She became a nurse's aide. Also at that time, after my father left the family, he would occasionally come back, break down the door and beat up my mother and go to jail. This was the pattern. So we lived in fear quite a lot of the time. We were hypervigilant wondering if he was going to come back. He had threatened to kill her quite a few times, so there was a lot of terror. When Claudette's dad left and her older sister went away to boarding school, there was suddenly more space for Claudette to come out of her shell. She was now the oldest, and she started making friends in junior high school. I always had a lot of friends in school, whereas before, uh, when I was in elementary school, I was really, really quiet. I was two grades ahead in most of my classes because my mother had taught me to read when I was three years old. So the teachers really latched on to my intelligence, and that was where I first started to get a little bit of confidence when they said to my mother, you know, your daughter is really something special. She has a really high IQ. And so she has a lot of potential. We're going to put her up two grades in in everything except math because I'm a moron at math. (laughs) I like sub-zero at math. So I was in my my older sister's level of classes. And then in junior high, they kept me in my regular grade because they said socially it had been so difficult for me to try and, and be in classes with kids that were two years older than me. I didn't really make friends that much in elementary school because... The kids, they were of a different social group. So um, it was a good idea to put me back in my regular grade level. I made better grades because it was easy for me. And I got involved in the band. I became a cheerleader. All these things while my mother was working two, three jobs and we were dirt poor. And I was bringing my baby sister with me to cheerleading practice, to band practice. It, it was crazy. It was like I was a single mother at age 13. <laughs> and I would just hitch rides with all my friends' parents, and I was basically on my own. It was interesting because I was popular in terms of I had tons of friends and I was getting, you know, elected for things, and people were kind of looking up to me. But I was never popular with the boys. My two sisters were very popular in both ways. But for me, I just didn't have any success in the dating realm. My sisters have said to me, well, it's because you were at a regular school, and egghead girls weren't really popular with the boys then. They went to an arts school because they both had scholarships in dance. And I went to just a regular all-American high school. So maybe that had something to do with it because I was considered to be a nerd. I was a major, major nerd. (laughs) But 
but I was a nerd who had tons of friends and absolutely loved my friends. I found that they were my chosen family. They were my saving grace. So Claudette does well in school. She graduates high school, but she's still really poor. During high school, I started college what would have been my senior year of high school, so I started a little early. I had a full scholarship to a college in my hometown, so I went there for two years. And then I decided to transfer to New York University. My friend in the drama department was auditioning for New York University's drama department, and he asked me to go with him. And I said, well, I don't know if I want to audition. I probably won't get in. He said, oh, come on. I know you auditioned for North Carolina School of the Arts and you didn't get in, but let's see how it goes. So I drove me and him to Atlanta and we auditioned together and I got in. Mainly, I just went to New York to get out of my hometown. Even though I had a lot of friends, my hometown was very conformist. They were very focused on status and money. To me, that was kind of a Southern thing back then. Like the girls who came from families that had the most money were the most popular with the boys. And people were really into having the right purse and the right haircut and all that stuff. So I knew that if I stayed in my hometown, I would be made to be like everybody else. And that's just not me at all. I had never been to New York in my entire life. I didn't know anything about the city. I thought it was like like on I Love Lucy. I honestly thought it was like that. <laughs> and this was like 1986. New York City was a toilet <laughs> at that time. The place where NYU put us as transfer students was a welfare hotel, basically. The lower floors of it were alcoholics and drug addicts who were living there at the, at the charity of the city. So there Claudette is in the toilet of 1980s New York City. She had been accepted by this super prestigious university. She had escaped her hometown. Really huge accomplishments, right? And then reality hits. So um, when I got to New York, I knew almost immediately that I had done the wrong thing getting into the acting, (laughs) acting program. Because I loved acting, I loved going out on stage and wearing a costume and all that. But the business part of it, I did not like. All the people in that program, it was the Tisch School of the Arts. It was a very prestigious program. And so a lot of the fellow students with me were professionals already. And they were talking about their agents and their managers. And they were, you know, basically reciting their resumes to each other the first week that we were there. And I thought, oh, God, this is so boring. This is, <laughs> this is not me. I, I can't do that. I can't run around selling myself all the time. You had to be super confident and sell yourself. And that's just not my personality. But the, the idea of being a flake was too much for me. So I didn't want to be a flake and abandon the program. <laughs> So, I I mean, my parents had borrowed money. I had come all this way. I had changed my whole life. And all the people back home were watching. So um, I stayed. Claudette had a classic New York City experience, by which I mean she lived in a tiny, shitty apartment with tons of roommates. She worked low-end jobs. Her mom and stepdad couldn't help her out. So she mostly lived off babysitting money. For a long time, I would have a half a can of Campbell's soup for my lunch, and then I would have the other half for dinner. That was my diet in those days, because that's all I could afford. And somehow I got through school. I still owed a tremendous amount of money to the school by the time graduation came around. But I was able to, they allowed me to walk at graduation. I was able to wear a cap and gown and participate in the ceremony. Then after that, I was working as a nanny for this family that was about to move to Los Angeles. And they said, you know, we're going to be living in Beverly Hills. Would you like to go out there with us? The kids will be devastated if we leave you behind. And I didn't have much going on. So I said, okay. And uh, so I went out there. I lived in with them for two years. And I was still pursuing acting, but realizing I was a huge 
failure at it because I just couldn't uh, sell myself. I just didn't have the confidence. And I got into the Groundlings Sunday Company, which is sort of like the B team for the main company. Started doing sketch comedy, but they vote you either up into the main company or just out completely. And I stuck it out for a couple of years in the Sunday Company and then got voted out. And my friends went on from there to get on Saturday Night Live. They had, you know, parts in movies. You know, their careers were progressing as they should have. And I had given myself 10 years to be an actor. And, you know, after 10 years, when I was 33 years old, I said, that's it. It's, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never gotten an agent or a paying job. So <laughs> clearly God is trying to tell me something. <laughs> At the moment Claudette was failing to become a professional, paid actor, she was nannying for a family. She let them know that she wanted to move on and find some other job. The dad in the family happened to be the head of advertising at Paramount Pictures, and he told Claudette that he tried to help her get a job. To Claudette's surprise, it actually worked. She got a job as a secretary at one of the ad agencies. And then she met Chris. And at that job, I met a friend, this guy named Chris. We, we were friends for a couple of years. And then we started dating. He was the first and only boyfriend I ever had. I had been on dates with guys before, but I never had an official boyfriend. And we dated for five years. We got married when we were 31 and 32. Uh, he was very funny. We had a lot of fun together. But he was very cold emotionally. I mean, to the point where if somebody started talking about feelings or anything deeper than, you know, really surfacey things like travel and things on TV, if you start talking about anything personal, he was bored and didn't want to hear it. So I kind of knew that I needed something more than that. But I kept saying to myself, he's the only guy who ever wanted to date me. So I better go with this and see how far it can go. And then, you know, at one point, I f because we, we didn't spend very much time together, even as a married couple. Both of us worked really long hours. He wasn't really into hanging out together all the time. We would go out every Friday night to dinner, and that was about it. And me being hyper-independent and very much a loner, that didn't seem strange to me. But in retrospect, I think, wow, that was a really cold, very superficial relationship. And, you know, I found out toward toward the end, I found that he was unfaithful to me um, more than once. And that's when we broke up was when I found that out. I just said, I can't stay in a marriage where this is happening. It was very devastating. I mean, I won't say that it was easy for me to walk out of that marriage. At that time, I was 33 years old, realizing I couldn't be an actor anymore. My marriage was ending. Everything that I felt like I had built up in my life was crumbling around me. And so it was a huge turning point, a moment of crisis. In that deep pit of terribleness, Claudette's life was shifting slowly, slowly, slowly. And she started to notice important clues that had been there all along. All the time that I had been sort of pursuing acting and working in advertising and pursuing a relationship with a guy, those were the things that people told me to do to make myself happy. And this whole time, I still felt this tremendous magnetic pull to the religious life. I was reading books about nuns all the time. I really thought I was going to be one of those people that was just nun crazy, where you buy nun dolls and you watch movies and you hang around with nuns. I thought it was just going to be that. When he and I were dating, he was a vehement atheist and would never talk about any kind of spirituality, God, anything like that. So I really had to sneak around if I wanted to pray or go to church or read anything that was spiritual, religious which I was still doing. I was praying every day of my life. It's always been part of my life and feeling like I had a, a conversation with God all the time. Even when I was hiding all of it from the public, I felt like that was who I really was, was this religious person who talked to God all the time. 
that people didn't understand it or they made fun of it, so I buried it very deep. When she and her husband acknowledged that their relationship was ending, she started feeling freer to investigate her long-held desires to have a religious life. The more vehemently atheist my husband became, the more spiritual I became. I started emailing Roman Catholic nuns when I was married, and I said, I'm married, and I still can't get this calling out of my mind. I'm drawn to this, and I don't know what to do. They were very understanding. They didn't think I was crazy. And one of them, one of the sisters that I was emailing, I said, well, you know, I have pretty liberal political beliefs. Like, when do you think the Roman Catholic Church is going to come around and change its mind about women being priests and um, reproductive freedom and LGBTQ, you know, rights? She said, the Roman Catholic Church is probably not going to change their mind on that for another 500 years, but you sound like an Episcopalian. And that was when everything changed. Because I said, the Episcopal Church doesn't have nuns, though, do they? And she said, oh, yes, they do. So I got in touch with All Saints Beverly Hills, which was near where I was working. At that time, I was working for a publicist in Beverly Hills. And I walked over and met with her. She was really kind, took me very seriously. She said, you know, a a calling is a real thing, and you've got to go with it and see how far you can take it. That's the point when Claudette officially initiated her divorce and started on her path of becoming a nun. I was surprised to learn that the process took her almost 10 years. She started visiting convents, sort of testing them on for size. And during that period, she started to take off the garb of her secular life and reveal what was underneath what she came to understand as her authentic self. Interestingly enough, it was my divorce that that led me into therapy and led to the search for how to present as my authentic self instead of pretending to be somebody I wasn't just to please other people. At that time, I also got into Al-Anon, which is for families and friends of alcoholics. And there was a lot of talk in Al-Anon about really being tuned into what do you like to do and what things are you really drawn to instead of doing what other people think is fun. That was a new concept for me to think about what I wanted and what I was drawn to because I had always been told that what I wanted and what I was drawn to was not normal. I was being told that as a woman, I was supposed to love shopping. I was supposed to love getting manicures and going out dancing and going out to clubs, those are things that I absolutely abhor. (laughs) And I thought there was something wrong with me. So I would try to pretend to like those things. I would try to feign interest when really I wanted to be at home reading a book. Or, uh, you know, I had a, as an adult, I got a dollhouse and was decorating this dollhouse and putting wiring in it and everything. That's what I wanted to be doing. I didn't want to be shopping. But I was told that that was weird, that I was a weirdo because I was interested in things that normal people are not interested in. You know, especially in Los Angeles, if you want to stay home and read and talk to your cats, you're some kind of a recluse that needs serious, serious therapy. But in my therapy, I learned that people have different things that make them happy. And when you get in touch with your authentic self, you have a list of Okay, this is what really gives me life. This is what really makes me happy. Around that time, I also read that book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Because I was really wanted to change course when I gave up acting. And I was thinking, well, what do, what do I like to do? And in that book, it gives you, it says, uh, think about your top five priorities in your life. And then put them in order, which is the most important. Number one, immediately I put God. And then family, and then um, career, and money, success. Like those were toward, that was at the bottom of the list. God was number one. And I asked myself, why am I not living my life as if God is my number one priority? When in my heart, God is the number one priority. So um, that was a big shift for me. 
Learning to speak up and set boundaries was a very new thing for me because I had always just done what I was supposed to. I was really into duty, obligation, uh, what other people needed from me rather than what I myself needed. And um, it was difficult because I lost some friends during that time because once you start setting boundaries and being your authentic self, the people who liked your fake self don't stick around. <laughs> they were friends with somebody else <laughs> that you created. So that was a big population change in my life for the best because then I was with friends who were supportive of me as a, a spiritual religious person. Some of them stuck with me. My actor buddies, they sort of humored me through this whole, they called it the nun thing. They would say, how's the nun thing going? And they didn't understand it, but they really stepped outside of their realm of experience in a very loving way and tried really hard to understand it. I'll always be grateful to them for that because they, they're they not religious people at all. They had no concept that this was something I had been hiding all these years and they didn't know me that way. But I started at work too, which was really difficult because I was working in movie advertising at the time and I had never openly discussed God or going to church or anything like that at work because everybody's so cool in Los Angeles. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> it's not cool to be religious. It's provincial. It's ignorant. It's backward. Um, so I risked a lot of ridicule by telling people, and I didn't really proselytize or anything because Episcopalians don't do that. We don't go around trying to save people. But instead, I would just occasionally mention that I was going to church or that I had a choir thing if anybody wanted to come. And lo and behold, people who didn't believe in God, were really anti-religion, would quietly come up to me and ask me if I could pray for them. One guy, uh, he had a four-year-old daughter who had leukemia. And he said, I'm not religious. I wasn't raised religious. My parents have nothing to do with religion. But I think that prayer might help us. So that's when I realized a lot of people who claim not to believe in God and religion believe in prayer. So I felt like that was a little gateway for people to understand that there was something beyond what we all see and hear, you know, in our temporal world. Prayer is something that I never would have thought my coworkers would ask me to do. So that was a nice little nudge from God saying, see, maybe sometimes people do accept this on some level. At this point, Claudette was in the process of becoming Sister Monica Clare, which would be her new name in this new world she was entering. A world many of us have never, ever seen and never, ever will experience. I had no idea what a woman had to do to become a nun other than, well, marry God. But as it turns out, it's quite the process. The process of becoming a sister is a little different in every community. But it's a little bit the same as well. Um, you have to be out of debt. You can't have any dependent family members or children. If you've been married, you have to get a divorce certificate and then have the bishop declare that you're actually divorced. So there are things that you have to get in place before you can even apply. So it took me about 14 years to get out of debt. They also tell you to visit three or four different communities because it's almost like choosing a college. You really have to go and visit and See if the vibe is a vibe that you can, you know, resonate with. And it's really a long process until you get to life vows. I mean, most people think you apply to the community, you're accepted, and that's that. But not really. It's sort of like um, professors trying to work for tenure because our process of becoming a sister up to life vows can be anywhere from six to eight years. You come in as a postulant for six months. Then you're a novice for two to three years, and then you're first professed for two to three years. All of those are temporary annual vows. They're not life vows. So I tell people who are searching, I'm like, try to think of it as you're getting a contract job for six to eight years, and then they're going to take you on full time at the end of the night. <laughs> so I think most people are not aware of how long it takes, and they're, they're greatly horrified when they find out. <laughs> When Claudette finally made it through all of her years of being a semi-committed nun, 
She was ready to take her life vows. She told me about the ceremony that happens, the ceremony where you essentially marry God. It's a ceremony much like somewhere across between a wedding and an ordination. We do not do the old-fashioned thing of wearing a wedding dress to take vows. Some Roman Catholic communities still do that because you're making a vow of chastity, which means that you are marrying Jesus. You're marrying the community. You're making a lifelong commitment, just like marriage. For me, the novice clothing where I received my habit was a really big transition because you're going from dressing like a secular person to dressing like a sister. And then when you're first professed and you're in temporary vows, you get the cincture, which is the, the belt thing around your waist, which has the three knots in it, which symbolize the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And then when your life professed, it's a, a church ceremony. You have hymns, you have a Eucharist in the middle of it. The bishop is there. The bishop has to receive your vows. You um, proclaim your vows in front of everyone. You kneel down at the feet of the bishop, and he places his hands on you and blesses you. And that's such a huge moment right there because the I believe in the apostolic succession of bishops from St. Peter, you know, all these Bishops have laid hands on each other ever since the earliest days of the church. And that Holy Spirit, the vessel of the Holy Spirit that a bishop is, you can feel it when they put their hands on your head and feel the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit carrying you forward into your ministry. Because I always tell people, you can't do this by yourself. God has to give you strength and courage and the tools to do this work because this is really, really difficult work. And that's where I felt like the, the strength of God was really sustaining me. I was so excited and I was thinking, I don't want to be like a Southern Baptist and start crying in the middle of this because <laughs> I was so overwhelmed with joy and gratitude. I got my wedding ring, which you get at your life profession. That was a big significant moment for me because I felt like I was, <laughs> I told my mother afterwards, I finally married a decent guy. <laughs> she thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it was a commitment that I really felt I settled comfortably into it instead of trepidation and, and fear. <laughs> Now, I'll start officially calling Claudette Sister Monica because that's her, well, let's just say married name. I told Sister Monica that I imagined she had gone through kind of a honeymoon period with the convent and her new community of sisters, and that I also imagined that the honeymoon ended at some point. I was curious what she had felt like after the newness wore off. For me, I was a person that Aside from the two years that I was married, all my adult life I had spent after college and after being a nanny, I had lived by myself. I always had my own apartment. I was very much a loner. I loved my alone time. So coming into a community where you live with a bunch of other people, that was the hardest part for me because everywhere you go, there's somebody there. And even though we're in silence, which really does help when you live in a household with a ton of people, it's really hard for me to come around the corner when I'm really deep in thought and encounter somebody who has a question or, or needs to talk or whatever. So I had to overcome a lot of annoyance at just being in the house with other people. I had done things my own way. I had been the head of households, you know, since I was a little kid, practically. And yet here were these women telling me that I wasn't emptying the garbage right or I wasn't loading the dishwasher correctly. And I was very indignant and thinking to myself, oh, I'll beg your pardon. I know exactly what I'm doing, which is a very common thing for women who enter religious communities because women are particular. We have our ways of doing things that are the right way. And then somebody else comes along and says, no, this is the right way. And then the third one will come along and say, no, this is the right way. <laughs> so we clash quite a bit in this community because I'm pretty mild mannered and mellow about most things, but I'm the exception. This is a community of very strong-willed women, very smart women. 
I told them when I first came, it was like a whole bunch of executive VPs decide to be a religious community. <laughs> and so there's too many chiefs, but we are an Augustinian community, which means it's not top down. It's not a bunch of obedient people with the superior just sort of dictating what to do. We make decisions as a group, as a whole. It is tough, though, dealing with so many strong-willed women. They, they really, especially if I'm really um, excited about an idea I have, I, let's do this, everybody, let's do this. And then all these strong opinions come in and start, you know, poking holes in my idea. I have to get really humble and say, okay, maybe there's a better way <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Apart from Sister Monica's introverted needs for quietude and the frustration she had with her sisterhood of strong-willed women, she also had her relationship with God, right? And that was the relationship that prompted her to change everything in her life, to uproot herself and re-root herself in a place that felt authentic and true to her. And that, that part, it was getting really good. Well, the interesting thing, I mean, because I'm married on two levels, I'm married to my community and to God. My relationship with God has improved significantly because before I came into a religious community, I prayed all my life and I never really heard anything back. I was just sort of, you know, talking into the abyss and hoping to find some kind of guidance or signs from God. And then after coming into a religious community, we work on our prayer life all the time. We try all different methods of prayer and we pray quite a bit. I got started getting a lot of feedback from God pretty early on, even when I was a postulant. I would feel definite guidance and I would feel a definite embrace, loving embrace and words and feelings in my soul that I had never felt before. It was very clear. So that's been wonderful, the deepening of that dialogue with God instead of me just having a monologue. I also had this crazy idea that the sisters were going to be these wise sages that would teach me everything, you know, that I could just sit at their feet and learn all this wonderful spiritual wisdom and uh, that they would behave themselves because they're sisters. And of course, they have to be good Christians and act like my grandmother did. But um, that is not how they are at all. They're just people. And some of them have bad tempers and some of them, they stick their head in the sand instead of dealing with problems. And some of them are loud and get on my nerves really bad. But the interesting thing that I learned about it was when you're working with people like that, just regular people who have regular personalities, you don't have to deal with them if you don't want to. You can deal with them in a professional way, but then you go home at night. And here we all have to live with each other. So over time, I realized, oh, I can't avoid sister so-and-so, even though I think she's mean to me and criticizes me too much. I can't avoid her. I live with her 24 hours a day. So I had to learn to really speak up for myself and to say to sister so-and-so, that hurt my feelings instead of just closing off and not dealing with sister so-and-so. And over time, you know, I've been here 10 years now. I finally recognized that I was learning emotional intimacy for the first time in my entire life. I was learning how to speak from a really deep place, speak my truth to people in love, and they accept it. And for the first time in my life, I am secure in the fact that if I present a self to them that is not pretty or not pleasant, they're not going to reject me and they're not going to abandon me. That was a huge thing. I remember having that realization a few years into this, and I thought, wow, this is why God has brought me here, so that I could learn emotional intimacy and really speak my truth instead of just being nicey-nicey. Emotional intimacy. Right. That's the reward that we get after being truly vulnerable with other people. But the question is, how to get there without becoming a nun, (laughs) forced to live with other nuns in a convent 24-7? Well, most of us will not take Sister Monica's life path, 
But I do suspect that many of us want, well, unconditional love. I mean, as hard as it is, we have to learn our truth and speak it. Speak up. If somebody says something that hurts your feelings, ask them, are you angry with me right now? Or, you know, that that really hurt my feelings. Did you mean it? Like, this is what I heard. Is that what you meant? And um, I think that is the most helpful thing because most of the time people don't do that. You just let it go or you just assume that they meant to hurt your feelings or you um, just assume that somebody meant to cut you down or criticize you and so you hold it against them instead of in that moment saying, is that a criticism? That was a big deal for me to learn that. I think people would be very surprised to know how emotionally difficult it is to get used to this life because um, most of us don't live in an authentic emotional place and we don't speak up for ourselves. That was the biggest surprise for me was that that was the difficult part. I thought that getting up at 6 a.m., I thought that wearing a habit, all the outer accoutrements of religious life, I thought that stuff would be hard. That stuff is easy. It, It didn't even register with me. It was not even a blip. The emotional stuff was the hardest part, the relational stuff. I realized after a while This is why we have religious communities, because religious communities are a microcosm of the world where you have all these people who wouldn't have chosen each other, who are thrown together in this situation. And we are called to love each other. We have to learn to love each other. And that's really difficult. Sister Monica dares to speak about all this deep stuff on social media. In fact, she has a pretty impressive TikTok following. In addition to deep topics, She has also posted about her skincare routine, book recommendations, and the convent's dog, Jenny. Because I was on social media, I was on Facebook and MySpace back in the day. Um, And then when I got into a religious community, I sort of got scolded because my posts were not exactly sisterly. They were sort of um, jokes that were sort of off color and commenting what I didn't consider to be off color, but my sisters did. So I learned that I had to present a public image that was sisterly, not just my L.A. self. I had to transition out of my L.A. persona that I had created into the sisterly persona, which is actually who I really am, and sort of put away all those masks that I had been wearing when I lived in Los Angeles and just be and still kind of trust that people would not be bored by that. (laughs) So when I got on social media after I entered the community was basically putting stuff out there that was prayerful. I learned, you know, okay, let's let's share some prayer and some spirituality with people and see if they're going to be bored by it, because I assumed that they would be. And I was really shocked that people were actually interested in it, commenting on it. I still have tons of friends on Facebook and somehow accumulated tons of followers on TikTok to a subject that I thought was totally not of any interest to the world whatsoever. I'm still in complete shock that the TikTok videos took off because one of the things that I was told in the secular world by not-so-nice friends when I was in my 20s and 30s was that I was incredibly boring, that my natural, authentic self was incredibly boring. The things I was interested in, history, religion, spirituality, that those things were boring. So to be on social media and have people be actually interested in it is just, I don't think it will ever cease to amaze me. The reason I do it is because I have a background in advertising and social media is free advertising to me. And when I was working in movie advertising, I didn't have any faith in the product that we were putting out to the world. In fact, I thought it was harmful to the world because there's so much violence in movies and There's a lot of misogyny and bad psychology. So I felt guilty about that. And then when I entered a religious community, I thought, this is a product I really believe in. (laughs) I really (laughs) think the world needs this. Because in advertising, we would always ask ourselves, what do we have that people need? And I'm always asking myself that about the religious life. 
And we have so much that the world needs, especially right now. So that's what I'm doing, advertising. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Full Moon Women with the funny, fabulous, and faithful Sister Monica Clara. If you'd like to see more of Sister Monica, you can check her out on TikTok. She also made an exclusive video for Full Moon members about a day in the life of a nun. You would be really surprised to learn everything that nuns do. Just follow the link in the show notes to see Sister Monica in action. If you really enjoyed this story, as well as maybe other stories that we have published on Full Moon Women, I want to invite you to join us, like officially. Here's the thing. To continue to produce this show, we need 1,000 monthly members by the end of this year. When we launched Full Moon Women in January of 2022, we did it without any financial backing because we trust that there are people out in the world who believe, like we do, that women's unpolished, unapologetic stories are worth documenting and sharing. We're independent storytellers on a mission, but to keep going, we do need support. So if this podcast is meaningful to you, I invite you to become one of the first 1,000 Full Moon members. Monthly members get exclusive content every month from our show guests, as well as behind the scenes stuff. And when you join, we send you a care package of special gifts to support your inner life. In the months to come, we'll be hosting live online events for monthly members, as well as launching a social space where you can connect with other women from around the world who listen to the show. To inspire you to join us sooner rather than later, we have a limited time gift for you. We've created eight original wallpaper designs for your smartphone or tablet. You know, since we all look at our phones more than we probably should, these wallpapers are a constant, consistent, and realistic way to surround yourself with good vibes and positive reflections. So if you become a $5 a month member before the end of April, you'll receive our Full Moon Women wallpapers as a special gift. Thank you so much for considering. We cannot wait to have you join us. So go ahead and check out membership at the link in the show notes. This episode was produced by Pete Herkmans and myself. It was edited by Pete. I'm Jamie Younger, and you have been listening to Full Moon Women.